when we watched the game last night, uh, a repeat of last year's national championship between Iowa and LSU, oh my goodness. I mean, the main talker, of course, was Caitlin Clark, scoring 41 points, 9 for 20 beyond the arc. Not only that, she had 12 assists, which now set a record for her. I think she has 137 total assists in um, in uh, tournament history, which is a, a record for the women. So she was just doing her thing, looking incredible. Uh, I'm not sure that's what everybody wanted to see, uh, which for several reasons we'll get into here in just a minute. But when you saw Caitlin Clark doing her thing last night, I mean— there's nothing to say except she is definitely the GOAT of college basketball. Yeah, she's a force to be reckoned with. And she was on a mission last night. You could see it. She wanted it bad. You know, they they lost in the national championship last year. It was a really hard fought game with LSU. They had the opportunity for a remake or a rematch. And you really couldn't have scripted it any better. Right. So I think Caitlin really, really wanted this. She's going to the final four. This is her last chance as a senior. But it also makes me excited as uh, as an Indianapolis native. And I know you are, too, Charlie. Um, uh, the Indiana Fever have the number one pick. So um, more than more than likely, it's a, pretty much a guarantee that Caitlin Clark is going to be playing at Gainbridge Fieldhouse in Indianapolis um, coming this fall. And that's that's pretty exciting. I know we might, Amber, we might have to take a, a group trip back together to Indy to check out Caitlin Clark one of these days. Yeah, I love that idea. I mean, and Dockage can come with us. It'll it'll be great. We'll have a we'll have a oh my. party at the Indiana <laughs> is this game. The, is this the Indianapolis network? Did we like somehow this is yeah, this is the Indy network. We didn't realize uh, all of us transplanted in other places at this point, except for Dan, who's still in Indy. Um, but Caitlin Clark was garnering so much support last night. I mean, people watching her from near, from far. Um, we have a couple reactions that we gathered from social media, one of them being from Super Bowl champion Chris Jones. He tweeted out the women's basketball games are more exciting than the men's. And that's actually a sentiment that we've been seeing more and more of. Um, I wouldn't personally say they're more exciting, but I definitely think we've gotten to a point where in a lot of cases they are equally as exciting, which is fantastic. Uh, We have Debo Samuel, bruh, Caitlin Clark can't be guarded. Uh, These grown men, I mean, these are two massive grown men who are just giving Caitlin Clark her flowers, which she absolutely deserves. Uh, She accounted for 71% of her team's offense. I mean, if that doesn't scream greatness, I'm not really sure what does. Um, But there's a lot of other things that people were talking about in the game last night. Obviously, on the other side of the ball was Angel Reese uh, for LSU. And um, people were talking about her, but they were also talking about something that occurred even before the game even tipped off. And that was the fact that LSU was not even on the floor, Amber, for the national anthem. Let's take a look at this. Do we have the, uh, the sot? This we do. There we go. Okay. Is there no sound? Or am I just not hearing it? All right. Well, that'll do it. We can we can cut it there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Amber, if you heard any sound. I couldn't hear any sound. But if you didn't, uh, that's okay. Point is, we were just showing the visual of the fact that LSU was not on the court leading up to the game. Uh, this was something a lot of people were very troubled with. Uh, But there was someone who came to the defense of LSU's team saying, you know, they're never on the floor leading up to the game. And Kim Mulkey after the game said, oh, you know, we have this pregame ritual, takes us a certain amount of time. I really wasn't paying attention. I don't even really know when the national anthem took place. All of this feels very strange to me. I feel like they would understand the optics of not being on the court, especially when Iowa was standing there strong, uh, arm in arm, ready to you know play one of the biggest games of their careers. What does it say to you, Amber, that LSU was not on the floor for the national anthem before this game? You know, I, it, it's hard to say because I, I certainly don't. I certainly don't see Kim Mulkey as being someone who is anti-America. I actually see, the, I, I kind of see her as, as the opposite of that. 
Um, I don't know her personally, yeah. obviously, but I, 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 she doesn't strike me as an anti-America lady. Um, but apparently they always go into the locker room at the 12 minute mark before the game. That's a routine they've done all season long last season. It, it's a thing that they do. I'm not sure why. Um, no one had talked about it up to this point. So credit to um, our own Dan Z for actually asking her that question because no reporter had done that prior to this. So, I mean, you could certainly argue that they they could work their pregame routine around the anthem. Um, I'm not sure it's something to get up in arms about, but it definitely um, it definitely solidified some people's opinions. I think there's this narrative leading up to this game, whether right or wrong, that um, it's kind of like the good guys versus the bad bad guys. And I know there were a lot of racial things thrown around. Um, I don't think it had anything to do with race. I think that LSU just kind of has this image, this like, this kind of like, this like tough, we don't care what you say kind of image. Pretty, where, yeah. Yeah. Iowa has more of like this, you know, wholesome girl next door image. I, I don't know. Um, none of that matters. Um, I think that this booming popularity of of women's basketball is uncharted territory for some. And so they've kind of relied on these like made up narratives and racism and sexism and good guys, bad guys, all that kind of thing to just kind of make it make sense. Maybe that's the case. But I, I don't I don't like the fact that all these storylines leading up to this have really overshadowed the fact that this is really great basketball and it's great for women's sports to have whatever you think of Angel Reese or Caitlin Clark. They're two of the best players in the country. And the fact that we got to watch them show down last night was really a treat for all sports fans. So I just I wish that we could give more credit to the basketball that was being played as opposed to kind of the, the personal attacks that have been happening on both sides. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I do believe, though, that when you want the focus to be on basketball, it's important to make sure that there are no other distractions or storylines, narratives that people can be talking about rather than the basketball itself. And to me, again, I also agree with you that Kim Mulkey, I don't think is an anti-America person. I don't think that she has ill intent for them to not be on the court for the national anthem. But I think Kim Mulkey also is a highly intelligent woman. And I think she's got to know how it comes across when, I mean, it's very rare. Let's be honest. It's very rare to not see a team in any sport leading up to the game, not be on the field for the national anthem. That's like, okay, we've gotten everything done. We're set, we're focused, we're ready to play the game. Even if it's not having anything to do with, oh, we totally support the national anthem. I mean, it's not about that. It's just about, okay, the game's about to start. We're on the court, across the court from the team we're about to play, and this is it. You know, this is just, we've, we're ready to go. And I feel like to not be on the court, no matter what your intent was, it definitely says something and does give people enough reason to probably start throwing around some ideas, true or not, uh, as to what the intentions of your team actually are. So I think Kim Mulkey probably moving forward should be more aware of that, especially given the fact that there is so much fire surrounding her team on a regular basis. Um, something else a lot of people were talking about leading up to the game, and, and you know, talk about the racial undertones, uh, which I don't love either. Uh, I think it takes away from the idea that we just watched or we were about to watch a Tremendous basketball game. Um, Haley Van Leith, who couldn't stop Clark all night, she she put up a valiant effort, uh, tried to contest many of those shots uh, from long distance, uh, but she did ultimately play one of the worst games of the season. Uh, and she was roasted, unfortunately. I, I mean, I feel bad for her for being embarrassed by Caitlin Clark. Though, Amber, she did make herself an easy target for Twitter trolls in recent days because she said that people look at LSU differently because they have a lot of, quote, black women with attitude. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. I think, you know, we do have a lot of black women on this team. Um, we do have a, a lot of people that are from different areas. And unfortunately, you know, that, that bias does exist still today. And a lot of the people that are making those comments are being racist um, towards my teammates. And, um, you know, I'm in a unique situation where... Um, I see it with myself, you know, I'll talk trash and I'll get a different reaction. I, I want to say that from my perspective, we've moved past a lot of this. I think that there are plenty of people who view 
Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, for example, the exact same way. I would say the majority of people. And if they don't, I wouldn't even say that it has to do with any idea of something being racially charged. I just think maybe sometimes people will like Angel Reese more than they like Caitlin Clark and vice versa. Sometimes people will like Caitlin Clark more than they like Angel Reese. I think a lot of times we're seeing the race being inserted into the story, into the narrative, uh, where it doesn't need to be. And it just gets people thinking about it more. And they start talking about it more because you brought this idea into existence and now people are having a conversation about it. Uh, how does it how does it make you feel uh, when you see Haley talking about her teammates like this? And on the other hand, probably, I don't know, it makes me feel like she's putting down Caitlin Clark in a way also by saying these type of things. Yeah, I think um, that video of Haley Van Lith, um, I think a lot of her comments were taken out of context. Um, I'm not saying I agree with her as far as, you know, her team just constantly being this victim of racism. I don't think that's true. Um, but I do think that um, what she was talking about was more of response to an LA Times article that came out last week. It was before the UCLA LSU game. And the guy who wrote it, Ben Bolch, he, he painted this weird picture of LSU versus UCLA as like this showdown between good and evil. Like just this picture he painted was so weird. Um, the whole article was, was weird. Like it's a basketball game, but he was trying to make it like almost like a biblical proportions as good versus evil thing. And a grown man calling a group of college girls, dirty debutantes, don't Google that on a work computer. Yeah. Um, it's, that's just wild behavior and it's completely unnecessary. LA Times ultimately took some of those comments out, um, issued an apology saying that it didn't meet their editorial standards. Um, so, I mean, at least that they, they did that. But I think that that's mostly what Haley was talking about is that article was really a just a blatant kind of attack on them. And it almost felt personal. Um, Kim Mulkey was also offended by that. She brought up the dirty debutantes thing. So I think that's a lot of where Haley was, was coming from. But as far as the racial narratives, those are entirely made up by the, the people outside of things. You know, we have Angel Reese versus Caitlin Clark, and it has nothing to do with their, their skin color. And those two mm -hmm. women have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. They've talked about it. Um, they've praised each other, even though they're, yeah, they're competitors. So in the game, they might talk a little trash. They might, you know, they might be one of these or something. And, and that's, 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 that's what they do. They're competitors. But, um, you know, Angel Reese reached out to Caitlin Clark when she broke the scoring record. Uh, they, they have a good working relationship. So it's just kind of a shame that like just kind of all these outside voices have really kind of tainted um, the legacy there, because I, I hope that this is not something that we're going to be talking about a few years from now when we look back uh, at this rivalry. But um, it's certainly uh, it's certainly kind of overshadowed the actual basketball part of things leading up to this point. Well, I also think, though, in a way, I, you know, there's some negativity you'd, you'd like to not address and think about. But in a way. You know, the, like they always say, sometimes any type of publicity is good publicity. And Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark, amazing athletes. I mean, it wouldn't matter at the end of the day. They're both phenomenal basketball players. But people have been talking about both of them nonstop because of this storyline that people have dictated surrounding both of them. You know, oh, they don't like each other. There's this, this racially charged, uh, you know, nemesis behind them. You know, they're whatever, they're enemies. Uh, I don't know. It has served them well, right? I mean, they probably get together and they just laugh at it because they know that it's not true and it has made them a lot of money and uh, raised their star power so much. So they're probably like, whatever, let these people talk about whatever they want to talk about. Uh, we're famous. We're making money. Uh, we have our whole lives ahead of us. What do you think is going to happen with Angel Reese? Do you think she's going to end up staying at LSU or you think she's going to go pro? Because that's something everyone's wondering right now. Yeah, I don't know. And I don't think she's really tipped her hat on this at, at all. Um, I mean, obviously she could, she could do either. She already has her national championship at LSU. So it's not like she has that unfinished business, which is one of the reasons that we see a lot of people um, come back and do their senior year to just kind of, uh, they really want that, that national championship notch on their belt. Right. So she yeah, already that has actually. that. Um, and she'd probably go pretty high in the draft. Um, obviously, Caitlin Clark is going to go number one, but I, I don't know. It should be interesting to see. But this is going to be a fun rivalry to watch, even as they go 
into the WNBA ranks, assuming Caitlin Clark goes WNBA. Of course she is. She was offered um, a big three deal for $5 million, but I think she's going, I think she's going <laughs> yeah. to WNBA. <laughs> but it'll be a fun I think she's going to be able to do both. I think she's going to be able to do it all because I think she has enough leverage where she could be like, listen, you're not telling me what I can and cannot do. I'm going to go make this money because you're not going to be paying me, but I love the game and I'm, I'm going to come help your team win right? A championship, but I'm also going to go play for Ice Cube's league. So let's just, let's just leave it at that. Uh, also, just as far as Angel Reese is concerned, I hope she's able to find a little bit more peace. Uh, she was crying after the game. You probably saw, uh, talking about receiving death threats since she won the national championship. Uh, she said, which stunned me that she hasn't been happy ever since. And I'm like, whoa, you haven't been happy. You have the world at your fingertips. You are making so much money. You're a celebrity. You have a team that cares about you. You've got a coach that cares about you, your family. Um, so that was sad to hear. So hopefully she can find some solace and peace um, after this game and whatever decision she decides to take uh, the rest of her career in, whatever direction. So, um, okay, finally, let's move on to what was, of course, over the weekend. Uh, Transgender Day of Visibility is what our president attempted to make it. Uh, he said on Twitter, on X, that he had a simple message to all Americans, and that is, I see you, you are made in the image of God, and you're worthy of respect and dignity. Okay, Amber, I mean, there's all types of people trying to make arguments. Oh, Easter falls on a different, a different day every year. He didn't know. It's like, First of all, if you're not paying any attention to what day Easter is on, then you're just a complete imbecile. Uh, but it definitely felt intentional. It definitely felt like he took a, a, one of the most important holidays on the Christian calendar and decided to put, you know, insert his progressive agenda on top of it, uh, trying to take away from, you know, this traditional holiday. What did you think about it? Uh, I'm sure no one in your family was celebrating Biden's holiday, but what was your reaction? Uh, it certainly didn't surprise me. Nothing this administration does surprises <laughs> me anymore. Um, I just I do love the irony of Biden saying you were made in the image of God, but also like take all these hormones and chop <laughs> off your body parts that God gave you. So that's funny to me. Uh, but, you know, yes, transgender day of visibility for the nine years it's been going on or however long has always landed on. March 31st. But as the president of the United States, you have the authority to move this made up holiday to a different day. Um, I, the White House probably thought the optics of moving it to Monday, which is April Fool's Day, was probably not great. Um, but they also knew. Oh, that would have been so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They also know if they did move it, they would get backlash from from that side, that mob, right? The leftist mob. So like they were really kind of in a lose lose situation here. I think they made the wrong choice, but it was a choice that they made regardless. And the best part was that a reporter asked Joe Biden about it yesterday, about declaring this transgender day of visibility on Easter. And Biden actually said, I didn't do that. Which is hilarious because um. either A, he, as somebody else is acting completely on his behalf and he has no idea what's actually going on in his own administration, or B, he did it and he just doesn't remember what he did the day before. And I'm not sure either one of those <laughs> is a good thing for the leader of the free world. Reassuring. But, uh, neither is reassuring now. <laughs> no. So uh, I don't know. I think the administration knew they were in a lose-lose situation at that point. They were going to upset the right or they were going to upset the left. But for Joe Biden to be a um, a devout Catholic, like he says he is, and to uh, just kind of undermine Easter that way, it just, it, it wasn't a good look. Not that he needs anything else to uh, bring down his polling or the fact that he's losing votes by the day. Do you think, though, that this is going to have even more of an effect? Do you think that there are religious people out there who are planning on voting for Biden and now maybe are already turning their backs on him as a result of this one move or questioning whether or not he's the right person to be president for a second term? I mean, it's certainly something they they should consider, but it's been a bad look for him all around. You know, last week he threw a huge fundraiser. It was like $500,000 or something to even get in the door. Um, and it had, um, you know, Lizzo performed. There were three presidents, Clinton and Obama <laughs> yeah. were there. He threw himself this huge fundraising party, right? But it just happened to be at the same time 
as the funeral for a slain, a slain NYPD officer. Trump was in town. Yeah, Jonathan Miller. Trump wasn't at that party. Trump was at the funeral for this police officer while Biden was, you know, schmoozing with celebrities and, and collecting money. So that's a really bad look too. And that's all just within the past week. So, I mean, we've still got several months for the election. Biden has plenty of time to continue to really show who he is and where his priorities are. And I just hope that the voters are, are paying attention. Uh, yeah, well, I know that I'm paying attention. Transgender Day of Visibility is one of 146 holidays on the calendar in a given year to celebrate the LGBTQ community. Uh, that's more than any other group, I imagine, uh, is being celebrated at this point in time. Uh, another number that I know quite well, Amber, is the fact that Joe Biden, you know, if we want to talk about who he is and what he's showing us about who he is. He spent more than a third of 2023 on vacation either at one of his Delaware residences, a posh vacation, Camp David. Uh, I mean, 138 days in 2023, that's 37% of the time. Yet he had the audacity to try and call out the fact that Trump was golfing recently and attempted to paint him as lazy. He tweeted out this. I'll tell you this. There's a difference between the two candidates in this election and to which I would say, yes, there is a huge difference, Amber, between the two candidates in this election, and not just in regards to the amount of vacation time that they're taking. Yeah. And you know what's funny is, um, first of all, I need to talk to Fox. If 138 days of vacation is is the norm, um, I need some more vacation days. <laughs> um, but um, Same. No, the, <laughs> the funny thing about not only him calling Trump lazy and essentially arguing that he's out golfing while he, Biden's doing important work is that he made fun of Trump for for winning a golf award at his at his own golf club, um, which was pretty funny because it's almost like he's suggesting that Trump can't actually play golf, which is a, a bold move, making fun of Trump's athletic prowess from a guy whose arch nemesis is a flight of stairs. So I think that Trump has the opportunity to do the funniest thing ever and just repeat Biden's tweet about, I'll tell you what, there's a difference between these two presidential candidates and just a video of him riding a bicycle and not falling. I think that's what Trump needs to do to, to kind of answer this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, Trump doesn't need to do much. Uh, this is just a great moment uh, for everyone to laugh. And I'm sure the memes will be coming out like crazy uh, from his camp, which I can't wait to see. Don Trump Jr. being the best. I mean, he always has the greatest tweets uh, in Instagram posts. Uh, he's pretty much undefeated in that lane. So uh, we'll see what he comes up with as far as all this is concerned. But Amber, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show as always. Uh, anything we should be looking out from you this week? Yeah, we've got Women's Planning coming. It'll be at noon on Wednesday. And this week, we're talking about the paradox of choice. I talked to a dating coach who was talking about a 2004 book that's even more popular or more relevant now in 2024, where, you know, with this dating apps and everything, we have so many choices. But because of that, it's like yes. we almost um, we we have this unrealistic expectation of what we want. So somebody might check all the boxes, but then we discard them because we're always looking for something bigger and better. And you can say that about both men and women. So we're going to dive into that and, uh, and see what some people have to say from our readers. Amber, it's like you're in my brain. I have been saying for years, the fact that there's so many options is ruining us because people cannot make a commitment because they always think that there's something better out there waiting for them. And guess what? I'm here to tell everybody. There sometimes is, but usually not. Yeah, not saying you should settle. You should not settle for less than you deserve. But um, we also can't be um, holding people up to these idealistic and unattainable standards um, in our dating lives. All right, Amber. Well, thank you so much. And we will see you soon. Cannot wait for woman-splaining. Thanks, Charlie. All right, to wrap up today's episode, uh, let's get to some comments made by Jamel Hill recently. Uh, she joined Uproxx to talk about the fact that she believes that Caitlin Clark is receiving more coverage than a lot of the other black players in current times, also historically speaking. Um, and she just went on this kind of a rant, uh, talking about how there's always been an undercurrent when it comes to 
African American women athletes and, and the sport that they play, uh, and that they always have to be something more than just a good player to receive the type of coverage that, for example, Caitlin Clark does. Uh, she went into a lots of detail talking about some other players that we've seen in history, Asia Wilson being one of them in the past, uh, just talking about how she was one of the greatest college basketball players for a good period of time, yet she still never got the type of coverage that Caitlin Clark did. I have a couple problems with this, one being that I don't think we can compare anybody now or before to Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark is in a league of her own, and that has nothing to do with her skin color. It has to do with the fact that she is quite literally the greatest of all time to play women's basketball. You know, she's already being asked to try out for the Team USA roster, and she's not even in the WNBA, but it's because they already know she's going to be drafted at number one. It's because they already know she's going to add such value to the team. They want to make sure that she's already putting this on her calendar, that she's going to be playing for the United States at the Paris Olympics. Caitlin Clark is phenomenal. Just look at what she was able to accomplish last night, 41 points. The, enti the, the entire game plan, as far as defense was concerned on LSU, was to guard Caitlin Clark, and they still couldn't get the job done. She is just that good. She's setting all types of records, scoring, assists. I mean, she is incredible. So she deserves the amount of coverage that she's getting. Secondly, I also think that the sport of Call, women's college basketball has just grown by leaps and bounds over the past few years. So now it's getting more coverage just in general. It has nothing to do with focusing on one player or another. It's a couple different players who have really just elevated the game, whereas a lot of people want to watch. And, and before, a lot of people weren't watching Women's March Madness. I wasn't watching Women's March Madness. I know a lot of my colleagues working in sports weren't watching Women's March Madness, but now the coverage has increased so much. I mean, even look at ESPN. They do all types of treatments now for March Madness on the women's side, whereas they did not do that before. So I think that it's fair to say that now women's basketball in general is just getting more coverage. So back in the days of when she's talking about certain players that didn't get as much exposure as Kate and Clark, it makes sense because the entire league the entire idea of women's basketball, college basketball, wasn't getting the same type of exposure as it is now. So I don't like that Jamel Hill said this. I feel like she's always looking for an excuse to race bait. Uh, that's her whole identity. And uh, I just don't like this. Caitlin Clark does not need to be overshadowed by this horrible argument that you're trying to make. She is, as I've said a couple times throughout the program, the GOAT. Uh, she deserves all of the flowers for this past season, for what she's been able to accomplish throughout her college career, for last night's game. Who knows, Iowa might even go on to win the national championship. And we know without a doubt she is going to be drafted number one in the WNBA draft. She is going to be playing at the Olympics. And I hope to God she is also playing in the big three league, making $5 million, because she deserves all all of that money. Um, okay, everyone, that is all the time we have for this episode. Thank you so much for being here. Make sure you're following me on social media at Charlie on TV, and I will see all of you tomorrow for another episode of the show. See ya.